Yeah, um, you, you know, um, that, that's a kind of a bigger picture question, um, which is automation and trade, uh, NAFTA and other trade agreements have really um, been done some harm to certain groups of, of workers, production workers and manufacturing. We have half as many manufacturing jobs as we had 30 years ago. Um, automation, um, administrative support jobs, clerical jobs have, have gone away. You know, we don't you don't handwrite something even to a clerk to type anymore and have her schedule your appointments. Do it all yourself without any thought. Um, so uh, those kind of jobs that were um, the bastion of a middle class uh, living, livable standard for a lot of people who hadn't got a, a college degree, um, they've really been hammered down. There's far fewer of them. Um, and the recession really accelerated that process, um, where it was kind of a long-term downward trend in some of those occupations, but it was to be taken care of because people, some people were retiring. And then all of a sudden, we had many people just dumped. Um, so what is what has happened is we have a lot of people who were in, in middle class kind of jobs um, who were a little older. It's, it's hard to go to college when you're 56 and have kids and a mortgage. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot a large supply of people now competing for those service kind of occupations that have been traditionally the bastion of younger people or lower skilled people. Um, so there's downward pressure because there's so many people available to do the, a lot of lower skill jobs. There's downward pressure on wages for that group. That is a big part of the growing in inequality. There's many, many other facets. But Representative Campbell? The Bill Clinton and his trade, trade package, they said we're going to hurt the, the middle class and working man. And he said it wasn't, but if it did, they change it. Well, it did hurt the working man, and they never changed it. We got President Obama now. It's trying to fast track a, a, a bill for his legacy, and it's going to devastate the working man in this in this country if, if President Obama gets away with this fast track fast track bill. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a, uh, many many facets to it. Um, uh, trade is one, and, and technology is. Or, probably even a bigger aspect. I mean, we've been able to automate many, many things. Um, and it's concerning, you know, the, a lot of the middle jobs have been hammered, and now it's starting, technology has gotten so cheap and so adept at doing so many things, a lot of concern about it moving into higher skill occupations and a lot of um, lower skill occupations. There's an awful lot of jobs that are threatened in, uh, in the future by technology, but technology has always created more jobs, but they tend to be higher skill, higher paying jobs. If President Obama has his way and fast tracks this, it's going to devastate the working man. Um, do you want to move on to the next Sure. Question? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Representative Gilbert. Thank you. Um, on the second bullet, uh, uh, you mentioned this men drinking workforce will automatically drive up wages. Is that statewide? Because what, what I'm thinking, in the late 80s, um, if you were working at McDonald's in York County from Saco, you were probably getting a lot better wages than if you were working at McDonald's in Jay because of the the lack of work in the Rim counties. So there may be a, a shortage of workforce. But do you think it's that can be applied statewide where it will find up? That you're, you're you're right. Averages in averages include everybody and, and and people talk about averages, but there's there's big differences across the state state for sure. Um, and many northern areas where the forest uh, products um, industry has been under tremendous pre pressure and many communities just collapsed. Um, there are, uh, there's a, an excess of workers, I guess, relative to the demand, so it, it, um, there isn't the, as much upward pressure on wages. 
Um, the demographics in those areas, though, are more stark. It's an older population, um, so for existing businesses, uh, they are facing generally more people aging out of the workforce. And the young people, um, you know, Roostick and Piscataquis and, and the like, have been staying around. Um, so how that will all play out in the balance on wages, you know, it's hard to say, but certainly there's been less pressure on wages in those areas than in Southern Maine. Representative uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I understand this is a work session, so the rules are looser than a public hearing, but I just wanted to make a comment that if we could stay focused on the minimum wage bills in front of us, we have a lot of work to do. It would be great to debate free trade and the Clinton right. presidency, but maybe some other day. Thank you. Thank you. Right. He's our taskmaster. He likes to keep us on task, and I appreciate it. Okay, so um, is the minimum wage providing a livable wage? Uh, no. Um, and I guess the question would be, is that what it's meant to be? One of the questions that I asked, and I, I, I glanced through this, and I don't know that it was answered um, <coughs> here or, or in the, um, our OPLA analysis, but do you have any idea what percentage of workers, when we first initiated the minimum wage years ago, what percentage of workers that applied to versus the percentage of workers that are currently paid in the I'd just be curious. Yeah, I don't know. The um, I think the minimum wage was passed nationally in 1938. And, uh, we don't have data for things back then. Um, my office has been doing estimates of the number of people working at minimum wage, and the oldest one I could find was 2004. And it was about 21,000 people. Today it's around 20,000 people. And in my recollection, I didn't look at any of the years in between, but it seems like it's always been right around 19, 21, 22. Um, year after year, somewhere thereabouts. Um, Representative Straccio and then Representative Campbell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm looking at the answer to the question that says the minimum wage is not meant to be a livable wage. Well, maybe now it isn't, but I will bet you that in 1938, $8 an hour, the purchasing power of $8 an hour, and 16000 about a year would probably be post depression or even still in the midst of the depression, a pretty good salary, good wages for a year. That when houses were costing a thousand or two thousand dollars and when cars were costing, I mean, proportionately, I mean, if we look back, I don't know that because it's not meant to be a livable wage now, that, that it's fair to say that it wasn't meant to be a livable wage back in 1938 because I think they based it on something. I mean, I wasn't, I, I haven't studied it extensively, but it just makes common sense that they would pick something, not the highest, and not the, to, you know, the, whole, the lowest, but something that somebody could either rent, live, eat, and granted, it didn't have to buy as much back then. There was a lot of stuff that didn't exist then, so I just am questioning whether that particular sentence can actually be a fact. And I think without knowing the percentage of people that were paid it at the time, that's, I mean, I was sort of asking the same question. Representative Campbell? And then we have Representative Fecto and Representative Ward, just so the committee knows. Thank you, Senator. This is for you, Senator. Representative Gilbert. Senator? Yes, sir. This is for you. Yes. I'm sick of Representative Lockman trying to lay out how we run things around here and what you say and when you say it. This is now a working. And we should be able to say what we want and answer the questions we want. And if you don't like it, let them leave. But I'm sick of listening to them. That's a point of order. For him. All right. Representative Fecto. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the things that I think uh, a few of us had on our minds during the, during the public hearing was uh, there was no data provided for how many folks are making wages between the minimum wage that we currently have and the proposed minimum wages made minimum wage increases. And I think that data would be, would be helpful. Um, we do have. It 
It was in the Department of Labor on page five. It's on page, not, page not. five of this one. Sorry. Right? The one yeah, today, the questions and answers oh, yes. five. And okay. it was in the back of the uh, testimony from last time. So while you're looking to see whether that answers your question, will that the representative board speak? Or ask a question? I swear I'm not talking about President Clinton. Oh, good. Um, or President Obama. <laughs> yes. No, don't get me started. Uh, looking at um, the um, the summary and uh, and this is there's some terrific information in here. This is the the this OCLA analysis. The OCLA analysis. Okay. And you were referring earlier to the fact that uh, starting in 1959, where Maine's first minimum wage was established at a dollar an hour, that today would buy eight dollars and seven cents worth of goods. And that's adjusted for some sort of CPI inflation index, I'm assuming. Is that normal market basket of goods inflation adjustment? How is that? That's my first question. How is that developed? How do you index it to 2015? What's the index? You're back on page A2. I am. Um, it, uh, I don't believe it was us that put that together. Okay. All right. This is yeah. This is our office. My office put this together. Uh, it was based on um, Department of Labor um, CPI inflation calculator. Uh, now, so that's a federal way. There's there's lots of different inflation indexes. There's market basket of goods. I work in the construction industry. I have a construction cost inflation index. It's based on gathering information. Would you say that the CPI inflation calculator that is used to produce these figures is reasonably close to the market basket of the inflation rate that we all experience every day? Okay. Uh, the consumer price index is the most widely used uh, inflation adjust. Well, it says here, Bureau of Labor Statistics CPI inflation calculator. Yep. Is that the same as that's, the normal CPI? That's, yeah. okay. Bureau of Labor Statistics is, is the source. Okay. Um, they do adjust the market basket over, over periods of time. There has been some um, criticism of the consumer price index over the years that it doesn't adjust as quickly. Like if beef surges in price relative to chicken and people are buying more chicken and less beef, um, they do, do make those adjustments over periods of time, right. but it won't be instantaneous right. if there's a sudden surge. But generally over the course of what do we have here, 41, 56 years, reasonably accurate. Yeah, there was um, uh, um, the former chief economist for uh, the first President Bush, Michael Boskin, did it after they were out of office. They had the Boskin Commission that, that did this whole thing on redoing the consumer price index, because back then there was a lot of concern that the market basket wasn't changing quickly enough. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, it changes better now. But I don't believe they restated inflation all the way back. So the so. CPI inflation adjustments are maybe a, a probably a little bit more responsible than they were 30 or 40 years ago. But my question is, does the inflation that's reflected here match generally the market basket of goods that people live off of? Buying cars, milk, bread, gasoline. That in general is reasonably accurate. That's uh, the intent of it. Yes. Okay. All right. Now, there's been an awful lot of talk about whether minimum wage is supposed to be minimum wage or livable wage. Now, I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at the figures have all fallen between in 2015 dollars, eight dollars and seven cents. The highest was in 19. 71 at ten dollars and 43 cents. Now it's uh, in 2009 it's 21. Obviously today it's at 750 um, and 2015 dollars. And then I turn to page five and I'm looking at this table. 2010 estimated livable wage: two adults, two earners with two children. Two adults, yeah, two adults, two children. The second paragraph from the Right. And all these figures, regardless of region, metropolitan area, or county, is on page five. All of the figures are, let's see, the lowest 
appears to be in Arista County at 1480. The highest appears to be in York Kittery South Berwick, 2140. Now that's also, that's in 2010 dollars, not even in 2015 dollars. Adjust that for 2015 dollars, my guessing those numbers will be a bit higher. Yeah. Okay. An employer employs one person, not two people and their right. child. Right. But what we're talking about is the, the assertion is being made over and over again about livable wage, livable wage, it, with, with the assumption being that that wage that one person makes ought to be able to be a livable wage, ought to be able to be the breadwinner, even though one-fifth of the people that work on minimum wage are head of household, which is 0.6% of the population. I'm having a hard time equating, maybe you can help me with this, between the fact that minimum wage for 50 some odd years has always been in today's dollars somewhere between $8 and $10.40 an hour, and yet, according to the data that's presented to us, that livable wage for two adults and two children is much, much higher. Doesn't that, I mean, these are your statistics. Don't that, doesn't that answer the question that minimum wage not only is not intended to be a livable wage, but it never has been, ever in the history of minimum wage, ever has been a livable wage. Can you help me with that? Well, the beautiful part of this is you all are, are the policy makers and you all decide uh, if the minimum wage you can be a politician. You can be a minimum wage and uh, you'll all be thankful that I am not the one who decides that. Asked and answered, kind of. And Representative Gilbert. And then Representative Sedkis, you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think my question is answered. It's on page five. <laughs> he had uh, so much time while Representative Wood was talking, <laughs> he was able to answer his own question. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, we talked about people, the number of people who work at minimum wage, and I had a question that relates to this chat here. In other words, close to 100,000 people, or 25% of our workers, are earning less than $10 an hour, according to this. Uh, reading that right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, certainly not all of them are the breadwinners for the family. Right. Okay. Thank you. Representative Stekas? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you were president during the hearing, um, and I think I mentioned, I've probably mentioned it more times than anybody wants to hear, is my major concern is um, the unintended consequences, and we're just talking about inflation, uh, and a portion of inflation is labor costs. And some of the reports that I've read directly link the minimum wage, in fact, I, I believe the numbers were every 10% the minimum wage goes up, the cost of groceries goes up about 4%. Uh, so, in a way, this seems like dog chasing its tail. Every time we raise the minimum wage, the cost, and, and we're trying to help these people make a livable wage, we keep, we keep moving their cost of living, the things that they're going to be purchasing, higher and higher and further and further away from their reach. Uh, do you have any information when it, when it comes to that sort of thing as far as, you know, labor towards inflation and, and you know, that, that type of thing when it, when it comes to minimum wage? Um, it's not something I've delved into uh, recently. In, in, each, in any industry or the nature of every business, the, their sh labor's share of their cost structure is different. Um, some are much more capital intensive, like a paper mill, um, where others would be more labor intensive, like a motel. Um, and so it would be very different from, from business to business. Um, when you increase the cost structure for a business, it comes out of something. It either uh, profits or um, an increase in that they get to pass along to customers or the like. But, you know, the, the one for one of uh, lower wage workers, what kind of buy products and services do they buy, and are they from the industries that are impacted? Um, that's really com complicated, and I have not dealt with that. Thank you. Um, certainly. And, um, Thank you. Representative Fetto has a question. So, 
And it sounds like to me the um, as far as businesses being able to to be successful, uh, to continue to stay open, to continue to employ more people, um, a one size fits all scenario when it comes to uh, forced labor costs doesn't sound like um, it's going to work. It would work that well. Uh, Ms. Rabinowitz had uh, had talked about the minimum wage, uh, the the unemployment numbers that come out came out yesterday, and it seems to me in, in, in our rural communities. I know in, I know in Somerset County, we have not come out of the great great recession at this point, and I'm very very concerned about the negative aspects and the consequences it's going to have on on our local <coughs> mom and pops. Uh, do you have anything to share with that as far as uh, you know, some of the poorer counties and and um, those, you know, with those unemployment numbers coming out recently, um, how um, how detrimental I suppose some of you know a forced, especially when you're talking the higher levels of ten or eleven or twelve dollars an hour. Um, well, any business that's that's under stress uh, in a community where um, the economic base went away, the mill closed, or the like. Um, certainly there are some sandwich shops that are on the edge, uh, or convenience stores, or the like. Um, you know, to specifically talk about the, the cost structure for that business and what does it mean for them going forward, or will they go be able to go forward? I can't, but you know, the ideas that you're relating would certainly apply to some businesses. Is that effective? Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so looking, I mean, the, the, what's been referenced pretty heavily thus far in this conversation has been this chart with all the different changes to the minimum wage over uh, these number of years. And what immediately pops out to me is we're about to hit the longest period of time in the state's history from when the minimum wage has not been increased. Uh, so that date being um, October 2nd, 2015, if we reach that point, Without the minimum wage increase, it will be the longest instance in time in which we've not, not raised it. And you had mentioned that the market has always done the same thing in terms of driving up wages on its own. Yet, again and again, we see increases to the minimum wage. So how can we justify continuing on this path of, a, of the, longest, uh, the longest time period in which the minimum wage has not been increased with the reason, with that very logic that the, the market always does the same thing, yet it seems like we've done the same, so, something very similar in terms of being consistent on raising the minimum wage over a period of time. Um, I guess my my thought is that uh, we have we are emerging from the most unusual time in the in our, the economy economic history of our country since the 1930s. Um, we are starting to get back to a normal state of conditions in, in terms of top line numbers like unemployment. Um, there still are uh, many individuals who are really struggling and many communities that are really, really struggling from closures and displacement that occurred at certain um, classes of workers. Um, but it, you know, it, I guess to talk about what's happened over the last six or seven years in terms of the last 50 years, it was an extremely unusual time, so I'm, I'm not sure that those kind of comparisons really apply. We, we are still emerging from a, a, a very difficult time. Well, I guess I'm a little confused as to why we brought forward a presentation of comparison. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was requested, this information. Um, and, and any other questions from Mr. Mills? And um, I'm sure that you're available to have questions in the future yep. on this issue. Thank you so much. <clears throat> If no one has any more questions or comments, 
did the department wish to present any additional information or did Glenn cover it all? some of the other information that we included in the answers. Um, the economic data uh, from, from Glenn Mills and Steve Berardi is the first two pages. Um, Senator Volk asked about uh, welfare to work and the average wage is coming out of that program and that data is collected. It's, it's, it's presented in two parts because the federal reporting year for that program out of DHHS um, is through October. Uh, and so we have some reports that the data is complete through October and then we're in the process of collecting the data um, from October to, to now. But that indicates that the average wage is 9.25, but some placements have been up in the nine, um, high 9 and $10 ranges. And it includes the information about transitional <coughs> support services for those Aspire workers uh, that are provided once they begin working from DHHS. And then the last uh, four pages, pages five through eight, are is an analysis of the impact on the unemployment trust fund, unemployment taxes, in terms of the current year of taxes, if, this, if, if one of these raises were to occur uh, starting October 1st, 2014, and then also analysis um, prepared by our actuarial on what would be um, the tax rates going forward and just as a reminder the tax rates for unemployment are set based on data collected through September 30th of every year and then the tax uh, rates are set in October and go out in December so if any um, impacts came with a minimum raise increase in October it wouldn't affect the 2016 rates it would be going forward um, it would affect the 2017 rates would be the earliest we could see um, the effects of the tax increases. Um, and then if there's any other questions uh, about uh, our information or um, any of the enforcement issues relating to the tip credit or to the training wage, uh, Director McGaffin can also speak to those. <coughs> with the, even the current minimum wage, even though it's been set in Maine for quite some time now, we still do find that some people are confused. Correct. Uh, again, for the committee, I'm Pamela McGaff, and I'm the director of the Bureau of Exchange. Uh, we have a plethora of laws that we enforce in the Bureau. Uh, I would say that roughly up to 50% of those bills are referenced or tied into a minimum wage component. Now, when I say that, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily not paid 750 an hour. Anytime you're not paid a final paycheck, it then in a sense is a violation of the right because you haven't been paid anything, so therefore it is a minimum wage violation. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're paying less than 750 and like 650 an hour, but it is a minimum wage violation. Anytime you have an overtime complaint, lots of times a minimum wage violation is coming about that. We recognize as a state a cessation of employment, vacation wages retain the same right as wages upon cessation of employment if it's under policy or practice. So, that also equates to a minimum wage violation under cessation of employment. So we do have probably 50 or greater percent of our complaint load is based on a minimum based violation. Technically. Technically. And to give you the actual thing, which ones are paid less than 750 and were paid 725 or 650, unfortunately my computer system is antiquated and does not provide the data to that level of degree. Any questions for Director McGaffin? Thank you. Any any other um, discussion or questions? Any votes, Representative Lockman? Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a question for Director Rabinowitz. Oh. Going back to back. some of her testimony. 
Um, chairs over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had a question about something specifically in your testimony, and I wanted to preface it by saying I've heard components of the minimum wage when asked, where is the money supposed to come from? I heard one particular response, the owner of the business and consumers will pay for this. And so that's why I wanted to focus on part of your testimony about nursing homes. Uh, the rural districts I represent for the last 10 years, nursing homes have had some real serious problems being underfunded, so I'm shut down. Uh, here's what you said in your testimony. In some businesses, like nursing homes, the need for human capital is intensive. Caring for ill and elderly patients requires people. But the reimbursement rates are fixed, and the government, government paid reimbursement rates are below cost. Nursing homes need custodial staff, food service workers, and CNAs, all lower skill occupations that earn lower wages. The nursing home does not have the flexibility to raise the reimbursement rates to cover the increases in wages these bills would require. Do you have any data specific to that industry on, on what the impact of any increase in the minimum wage would be? I don't have anything specific to nursing homes in terms of a, in terms of a data set. I do know that uh, both the governor and commissioner Mary Mayhew of DHHS have often spoken about the crisis in nursing home funding that we have through main care, um, and particularly the nursing homes in the rural parts of the state. But I did provide uh, in the back of that testimony um, a sample wages for the short order cook and for the uh, for a nursing assistant to show you that they are within that range. And as as um, our chief economist uh, Glenn Mills just spoke to the component of labor in those different positions. Um, you know, what is the labor cost? Where can that cost be passed on to? Is going to be different for different industries. Nursing homes are uh, an example of the inelasticity of certain industries to absorb those wage increases. Um, it, when we look at uh, this, the state government for, for, as another one. Um, if there were to be a bill that passed, there would be a fiscal note for the state government uh, that would have to be <coughs> identified where those wage increases would come from from appropriations. So, to to say, oh, it's you know, we just raised the prices. Um, there were a number of businesses that testified as to the, the difficulty of that, and and our concern in the department's testimony was, who do you lay off in the nursing home when the when push comes to shove because they're already starting to close. Um, and then w at what price is that minimum wage in terms of the care for that patient and for the low skill worker who needs, needs that job? So was that information in the testimony you gave us at the hearing? The paragraph that um, Representative Walkman read was in that testimony. And the wage yes. information on the... the and the wage information with, this, with the nursing was assistant all. was attached at the back, yeah. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Very much, uh, Ms. Rabinowitz. Do you have any statistics on how many people that work in nursing homes that get minimum wage right now? We have the wage data available on the CWR website that indicates the wages for certain occupations, and we can we can pull that out. The other question I would have is, uh, with Maine being the second largest state in the country with uh, seasonal work workers, uh, is there any statistics that can show basically how many how many uh, main workers or seasonal workers or, or either either or both get minimum wage and how many of them actually work two and three different jobs minimum wage. Do you want to We don't, there's, there's, uh, up Maine has enormous seasonal swings, anybody driving along Route 1 in the summer sees that, um, second only to Alaska in the states. Um, what people are earning specifically and how many jobs, um, we don't know. Many, many of those are second jobs, you know, on a weekend or something like that. Some are, and of course many are kids, schools out, um, but how many are Specifically, working minimum wage or, or working multiple way, multiple jobs to make ends meet, living on their own or with a family. That's we don't have. Follow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there 
Is there any statistics to track how many people that get minimum wage that get food stamps, main care, or anything else like that? I, yeah, that would be from DHHS. I'm, I'm not sure. What you know, the studies on minimum wage. Um, you know, really, at its heart, what, what, what everybody wants to address is poverty. Um, and uh, all of the studies that delve into who is on minimum wage and the con connection to poverty is very low, actually. A very small share of people making at or near or below minimum wage are actually in poverty because um, they are either kids living with their parents, a spouse with a, a second income, or other circumstances, a student in college, um, and most are working part time. We know from another source, almost everybody works part time, chooses part time work. Um, so the the connection with poverty is not is not near as strong. It's not the best tool, I would say, to address poverty. Most of the people in poverty are in poverty because they're not working. talking about specific reimbursement rates that are paid for at set schedules with, with relatively in, inflexible um, payment procedures would run into that. And certainly uh, hospitals, again, are another industry that have a lot of food service and custodial staff as well as, as, well as uh, nursing assistants and entry level um, uh, you know, office assistants who would be